on behalf of Council, we welcome all who are worshiping with us here this afternoon. Council has the following announcement. Consistory hopes to meet the Lord willing tomorrow evening at 7.30 in this church building and the offerings today are for the Barhead Food Bank. I now ask those who are able to please rise. Congregation of our Lord, where does our help come from? Grace, mercy, and peace from God the Father and Christ Jesus our Lord. In response to the Lord's blessing, let us sing from Psalm 33, verse 1 and 2. now profess our faith with the singing of the Apostles' Creed as it was put to music in hymn one.
Let us now bow our heads and ask the Lord for a blessing over this worship service. Merciful God and Father, we come before you asking you for your blessing upon this service. As we sit here listening to your word, will you open our hearts and our minds to be receptive to the message being read. May we delight in hearing your word, seeking out its meaning for us and our life. May we stand in awe of your greatness and majesty. Lord, we sit here as undeserved sinners, undeserved of the grace you have shown us, undeserved to have your Son die for our sins. May we truly realize the magnitude of our sins against you so that we may truly stand in awe of your grace towards us. Lord, we need your word to guide us. May we treasure the time that we spend together here in worship. Lord, we ask for your continued blessing upon your congregation here in Barhead. May we grow in our knowledge and understanding of your majesty. May we continue to encourage each other in our walk of faith. May we continue to be a light to those around us each and every day. We ask all this in the name of our faithful Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us sing from hymn 13. The reading for this afternoon will be found in Isaiah, verse 40, which was also put to music in the hymn we just sang, and we will read the verses 12 to 31. Hear the word of our Lord. Who has measured the waters in the hollow of his hand, and marked off the heavens with a span, and closed the dust of the earth in a measure, and weighed the mountains in scales, and the hills in a balance? Who has measured the spirit of the Lord, or what man shows him his counsel? Whom did he consult, and who made him understand? Who taught him the path of justice, and taught him knowledge? and showed him the way of understanding? Behold, the nations are like a drop from a bucket, and are accounted as dust on the scales. Behold, he takes up the coastlands like fine dust. Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, 
nor are its beasts enough for a burnt offering. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing and emptiness. To whom then will you liken God? Or what likeness compares with him? An idol, a craftsman casts it, and a goldsmith overlays it with gold and casts for it silver chains. He who is too impoverished for an offering chooses wood that will not rot. He seeks out a skillful craftsman to set up an idol that will not move. Do you not know? Do you not hear? Has it not been told you from the beginning? Have you not understood from the foundations of the earth? It is he who sits above the circle of the earth, and its inhabitants are like grasshoppers, who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them like a tent to dwell in, who brings princes to nothing and makes the rulers of the earth as emptiness. Scarcely are they planted, scarcely sown, scarcely has their stem taken root in the earth, when he blows on them and they wither, and the tempest carries them off like stubble. To whom then will you compare me, that I should be like him, says the Holy One? Lift up your eyes on high and see who created these. He who cre brings out their host by number, calling them all by name, by the greatness of his might, and because he is strong in power, not one is missing. Why do you say, O Jacob, and speak, O Israel, my way is hidden from the Lord, and my right is disregarded by my God? Have you not known, have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. His understanding is unsearchable. He gives power to the faint and to him who has no might. He increases strength. Even youth shall faint and be weary, and young men shall fall exhausted. But they who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength, and they shall mount up with wings like eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. We find the text for today in Lord's Day 9 of the Heidelberg Catechism. It's on page 525. What do you believe when you say, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth? That the eternal Father of our Lord Jesus Christ who out of nothing created heaven and earth and all that is in them, and who still upholds and governs them by his eternal counsel and providence, is, for the sake of Christ his Son, my God and my Father. In him I trust so completely as to have no doubt that he will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul, and will also turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this life of sorrow. He is able to do so as Almighty God and willing also as a faithful Father. <coughs> Beloved, this afternoon we are going to speak about galaxies and sandwiches. The good news about the fatherhood of God, the creator of heaven and earth. God the Father is our first loving Father, second almighty creator, and third faithful provider. God the Father, the almighty creator of heaven and earth, is our loving Father. God, who created everything we see and everything we don't see is our Father. We may call him Father. An amazing thought. Here we are on this rather small planet called Earth. 
Imagine we could reduce the earth to the size of a marble and set it on a table. And then we would place a smaller par marble less than a meter away from the earth. That would be the moon. Then, about a hundred meters away, we would set a volleyball. That would be the sun. The sun is our nearest star. And if we wanted to include the second nearest star, we would have to place another volleyball on the other side of the world, in China or Korea, and we would still not be far enough away. As you know, seven other planets circle the sun. We call this a solar system. And several solar systems make up one galaxy. The universe has countless galaxies. It's only in the last few decades that we have begun to realize how vast the universe is. It's only since man has begun sending up space probes and has invented giant telescopes that we have begun to realize that Earth is nothing but a tiny little pinprick upon the fabric of space. We have also discovered how fragile our existence on planet Earth is. Covering the Earth is a crust, and every once in a while that crust moves. We call it an earthquake, and then we feel vulnerable. And surrounding the Earth is a blanket of air called the atmosphere. If that blanket were pulled away for less than an hour, the Earth would burn to a crisp. That's how fragile our existence is upon this Earth. And now, on this tiny marble, we make our confession of faith. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. We, tiny people on a tiny planet, in one of the solar systems, in one of the galaxies, claim that the God who created all this is our Father. Now that is an amazing thought. But we are not the first people in the world to be amazed by this. The prophet Isaiah was amazed by this fact as well. In Isaiah 40, the chapter we read, the prophet compares the greatness of God to the puniness of man. He says that compared to God, all the nations of the earth are like a drop from a bucket. If you are carrying a pail of water and a drop of water splashes out, you don't even notice it. The nations of the earth are to God like a speck of dust on a scale. If you're going to weigh yourself on your scale, you don't first get down on your hands and knees in order to wipe away a speck of dust. That dust is insignificant. All the cedar trees of the forest of Lebanon would not suffice for fuel, for wood, to sacrifice a burnt offering to God. All the animals living among those cedar trees would not be enough, would not do as a burnt offering to the Lord. All the nations are as nothing before him. They are accounted by him as less than nothing, as emptiness. How small is mankind? How puny his existence? The prophet Isaiah knew it long before the astronomers knew it. But how great is God? To whom then will you compare God, says Isaiah? What image will you compare him to? Lift up your eyes, O man, on high and see. Use your biggest telescopes, O man. Look through your hundred-inch reflecting telescopes on top of isolated mountains. Train them on the faraway stars. Send out the Hubble Space Telescope. Take photographs of distant galaxies. Our own Milky Way galaxy, the Andromeda galaxy, and the Magellanic clouds. Who created them? asks Isaiah. God created them. He who brings their host out by number. He who knows each star, each galaxy by name. There are many, many more stars in the universe than people on the earth. 
and God knows each one of them by name. Now if God is so great and we are so small, we might think that we had better not get too familiar with him. We might think that God would not be concerned about us. What would he care? If all the trees in Jasper Park could not serve as fuel for a sacrifice for God, if all the livestock on every farm in Alberta would not be enough for a burnt offering to God, then surely that great God is not concerned about me. Surely we little people living here on just a small part of this little planet, surely we had better forget about calling that great God Father. And does it not seem completely out of proportion to teach our little children to say, Lord bless this food, when you give them a sandwich at lunchtime? Is the God who holds the galaxies together interested in a little child's sandwich? We might be inclined to reason like that. We might tend to think that because God is so great and majestic, powerful and awesome, he cannot possibly be interested in our petty little things. But beloved, Isaiah 40 opposes that way of thinking. It teaches exactly the opposite. The Bible does not say because the nations of the earth are like a drop from a bucket and like dust on the scales, therefore God is not concerned about a child's sandwich and mother's headache. It says the opposite. It says, because the nations are like dust, therefore God knows everything about your life and is very concerned about your life. Because he created the galaxies and holds the solar systems together, he cares about a little boy's and little girl's lunchtime sandwich. He's concerned about every tiny, seemingly insignificant aspect of your life. Israel was thinking in this mistaken way. They thought that if God created the heavens and the earth, the stars of the heavens, and if he knows all the same, then surely he wouldn't pay any attention to them on earth. Isaiah contradicted that wrong way of thinking. He said in verse 27, immediately after speaking about the power of God, he says, Why do you say, O Jacob, and complain, O Israel? My way is hidden from the Lord. My cause is disregarded by my God. Do you not know? Have you not heard? The Lord is the everlasting God, the creator of the ends of the earth. He will not grow tired or weary, and his understanding no one can fathom. He gives strength to the weary, but to those who hope in the Lord, but to those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Isaiah did not say, How do you dare call him father? Rather, he said, Why do you say that he doesn't see you? Why do you say that he is not concerned about you and about your problems? Of course he sees you. Of course he cares about you. He gives you strength. You can hope in him. He renews your strength. He is a faithful father. That is what we, the confessing church, state here in Lord's Day 9. That God, the creator of heaven and earth, the God of the galaxies, is our father. Our father in Jesus Christ. For the sake of Christ, because of what Jesus Christ has done, because the eternal Son of God united himself to the human race and bore our sins to the cross. Because he was not ashamed to call us his brothers and sisters, God has adopted us into his family. We are children by adoption, but we are truly children. Just as adopted children really and truly are children of their adopted parents, so we are really and truly children of God. Just as adoptive parents will consider their adoptive children in the same way as their begotten children, so God the Father considers us in the same way as he considers his begotten Son, Jesus Christ. Now that's quite a claim, but it's true. For the sake of Christ, God looks upon us as if we never went astray. He looks upon us as if we never sinned, as if we never left his house. Adam was the son of God. That's what Luke calls him 
in Luke 3. There, Luke gave the genealogy of the Lord Jesus, and he ended by saying that Adam was the son of God. Sin broke that beautiful father-child relationship which Adam enjoyed with God, but it is now restored again in Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ, the second or the last Adam, restores us to being sons and daughters of God the Father. Through him we again have access to the Father Jesus. Father. Jesus Christ reveals to us the Father. He makes all things well again. The promise of adoption was signified and sealed to you when you were baptized. The question can be asked again today. What are you doing with that promise? the promise of adoption. Do you worship God as your father? Do you trust him as your father? Are you obedient to the rules of his household? God is a loving and gentle father, beloved. He is patient with his sinful children. He is patient with sinful children who repent and ask him for forgiveness for the sake of Jesus Christ. He is patient with sinful children who plead with him for the grace of his Holy Spirit to fill their lives and help them to resist temptation to sin. But he will deal firmly, decisively with sinful children who do not repent, who stubbornly continue breaking the rules of the household who know better because they've been brought up by Mother Church and have been instructed very well in the ways of Father's will, but who yet go their own way. With these children, God is patient for a while, but his patience will run out. If children continue ignoring the commands of God the Father and continue ignoring the admonitions of the instructions of Mother Church, then Father's patience will run out and he will disinher disinherit those children. He will send them away empty. That's the warning and it must be heard. Let each of us respond favorably to the wonderful promises God has given us. Our Heavenly Father is not a Father who comes to us with a big stick. He's a loving Father who comes to us with his blessing with his love, with his promises, with his gifts. Let us respond to him with love and with obedience. Second, we confess God as our Father in Christ. We also confess him as our almighty creator. We believe that God created everything out of nothing. As Hebrews 11 verse 3 says, by faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command so that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. God did not use materials to create the world and the universe. As we learn from Genesis 1, God simply spoke. He said, let there be light and there was light. He said, let the skies be filled with birds and the seas with fish. And it happened. That's how God created everything. As you know, this doctrine of creation, as it is revealed to us in the Bible, is a doctrine which is often attacked. There are many questions which are hard to answer. When we read Genesis 1 and 2, we are left with many questions which are not easy to answer. But coming with theories of evolution, or with the idea that God somehow used evolution to create the world is not the right answer either. Let us continue listening to scripture, which says in many places, not just in Genesis 1 verse 2, but in many places that God created the world and the galaxies by his word. Psalm 33 verse 6, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth, all their hosts. Revelations 4 verse 11. Worthy are you, O Lord, our Lord and God, to receive glory and honor and power, 
For you created all things, and by your will they existed and were created. And Isaiah 40, 45, verse 18, For thus says the Lord who created the heavens, He is God, who formed the earth and made it. He established it. He did not create it empty. He formed it to be inhabited. I am the Lord, and there is no other. There are other places in the Word that say that God created the heavens and earth out of nothing by His Word. Astronomers estimate that there are millions, some say billions, of galaxies. And each galaxy has billions of stars. God created it all by His Word. There still might be questions in our minds as to how it all works, as to how everything came to be, how God created it all. But let us listen to what God said in Job 38, when Job was in danger of becoming a bit of a know-it-all. God said, Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth? Tell me if you have understanding. Who determined its measurements? Surely you know. Have you entered into the springs of the sea or walked in the recess of the deep? Can you bind the chains of the Pleiades or loose the cords of Orion, the constellation of stars? Can you send forth lightning that they may go and say to you, here we are? Let us in humility and awe continue believing that God is our creator. There's more at stake than simply the interpretation of a few Bible texts. And by the same token, the ideas of evolution are much more than simply some notion about how everything we see came into being. Evolution says that we are here by chance. What we see around us is just one of the infinite possibilities that chance could have produced. There's no notion of God unfolding history according to his eternal plan. Just chance. Evolutionism says that we are here because of a chemical accident. If that were true, then it would not matter how we live. If evolutionism is correct, then we may as well live it up, party, and have a good time, because sooner or later we're going to die, and then the party will be over. Make the most of it while you've got a chance. Don't bother asking silly, irrelevant questions about responsibilities or purpose. We've got no purpose. There are no goals. Just have a good time, and don't worry about what happens when you die. Nothing happens. You die. That's it. At the end of the life, you're a worm food. That's it. Those are the logical, ethical conclusions to which evolutionism drives a person. And we see clearly the godlessness and the revolutionary character of the theory. But if we have been created, then it's completely different. If we've been created, then there is one who is infinitely greater than us, who is our creator, and who created us for a purpose. Then life has a purpose. It has a goal. And we know what that purpose is. That purpose is to love God and to serve him with all that we have. And we know what the goal is. The goal is to live forever with God in eternal blessedness and perfection. We know that this existence is not the product of a freak chemical accident. We know that this existence is in the hand of God. We know that God created the world and that he has not abandoned it. He is still intimately involved with his world, with his universe. He has a plan for his creation. He is bringing that plan to its goal unfolding it in history. And he is intimately involved with the lives of each of us. He not only takes care that the planets and stars keep revolving in the correct way, he also takes care of every aspect of our lives. For not only 
is he our loving father? Not only is he our almighty creator, he is also our faithful provider. Third, we believe that God to be our faithful provider. This has to do with the last part of Lord's Day 9 where we confess, in him I trust so completely as to have no doubt that he will provide me with all things necessary for body and soul and will also turn to my good whatever adversity he sends me in this life of sorrow. He is able to do so as Almighty God and willing also as a faithful father. God provides food for the sparrows of the air. He clothes the lilies of the field. How much more won't he take care of those who seek first his righteousness and his kingdom? Now this doesn't mean that all our problems magically disappear. Neither is this a promise that we will all become very wealthy by worldly standards. It doesn't mean that we're never going to experience unpleasant things in this life. This life is a valley of tears, not a harlequin romance. It is a constant death, and it will continue to be such until the Lord Jesus comes and makes all things new and perfect. But in the face of all life's adversities, we have the unshakable promise of God that in everything he works for good and with those who love him. When you were baptized, then Father promised you that he would avert all evil or turn it to your profit. Even when God sends unpleasant things into our lives, whatever they might be, God will turn them to our good. There might be times when we will scratch our heads wondering how this or that could possibly be good for us. But when we're standing on the other side of glory, we will see very clearly. Now we see in a glass darkly, but then we will see everything with perfect clarity. The Heavenly Father knows best. Let us continue trusting in Him completely, trusting that He, according to His promise, will give us all that we need for body and soul to serve him. Let us continue believing that God is working for our good. He is bringing about his plan for us. He is bringing about his plan for a new heaven and a new earth. He is working towards his goal of conforming us completely to the image of his Son, Jesus Christ. And so, let's not come with our objections nor with anger. Even when things are unpleasant, continue trusting in your faithful Father. Continue trusting that he will turn to your good, also the adversities of life. He's able to do so, you know. He's Almighty God. He holds the galaxies in the palm of his hand. And he's willing too, for he's faithful Father. He gives me my sandwich. This is my Father's world. Why should my heart be sad? The Lord is king. Let the heavens ring. God reigns. Let the earth be glad. Amen. Please rise and we will sing Psalm 33, verse 5 and 6.
Shall we pray? Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the opportunity to again worship you here this afternoon. We thank you that you are the creator of the heavens and the earth. We thank you that you created us. And we thank you that your son died for our sins. We just heard that you know our struggles, you know our burdens, and you know our inmost thoughts. Indeed, nothing is hidden from you. Lord, we know that you greatly care for each one of us. Enough that you are willing to send your only son to die on the cross for us, for our sins against you. Lord, may we feel your fatherly hand upon us as we go forward this coming week. May we be strengthened by your Holy Spirit in our struggle against sin, the devil, and our own flesh. May we eagerly seek to grow in our knowledge of you and reading of your word and through diligent prayer. Lord, your commandments are true and right, and may we seek to live by them always, seeing them as a blessing and not a burden in our life. Lord, we have been richly blessed. We see it in the freedom we have in our worshiping here this afternoon. We see it in the schools we are allowed to have and maintain. Lord, we also ask that you will again bless the annual school fund drive that we hope takes place tomorrow evening. Lord, we ask that you help us to have giving hearts, also in regard to giving within our local community. And so we ask a blessing over today's collection for the local food bank. May those experiencing difficulty be aided by our financial gifts, but even more so, may they come to receive your spiritual gifts. Lord, may we all learn to drink from the well that never runs out. May we all hold on to your covenant promises to us and our children. We ask all this in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, who is the way to eternal life. Amen. The sermon which we just heard was made by the Reverend George Van Popta, Minister Emeritus of the Jubilee Canadian Reformed Church in Ottawa, Ontario. The offertory this afternoon is for the Barhead Food Bank. After the collection, we will rise and give glory to God with the singing of Psalm 121.
Receive now the Lord's blessing and go in peace. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.